Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel, it's Bill. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you went to assemble a video and you found out you didn't have any of the footage at all? Well, that is the case in this segment of DDS Cave Conference for 2022. So Keith and I had assembled the first video. We've got the second video coming to you pretty quick. So we turned our direction to the third video and we found out all we have is Dr. Ebersol standing up but that's it. We don't have any of his lecture. So we stopped, we scrambled. I reached out to Douglas Ebersol himself uh, and asked the good doctor to see if uh, he had notes that he kept for the lecture, uh, may have had a recording of it, anything. He actually came back and responded he had something better. He, I'm giving that exact same lecture this next week for Cape Coral Dive Club. I said, cool. Cool. is there any way that we can record it? So Dr. Ebersol, he got us in contact with Brandon Walters and uh, he recorded the, the lecture for us and he sent us a link so we could download it so we can complete the six part segment in this CAVE conference for you. So we do appreciate Brandon Walters for providing this video, for helping us take the time to record it. Um, please see his link down below in the description, uh, Cape Coral Dive Club. He also has a, a shop that he runs. He does training out of it and everything. Please stop by, give him some thanks for everything that he helped us do on this video. And I hope you enjoy it and we'll see you at the end. My name is uh, Doug Ebersole. Um, I'm a, a cardiologist up here at the Watson Clinic. I've been here for about 25 years. I grew up in Florida, and I'm also the, uh, the director of the Structural Heart Program. Uh, what that basically means is my job involves going to work in my pajamas and playing video games all day. Uh, I just basically go to and from in scrubs, and I'm working in the cath lab in the operating room doing uh, procedures. That job actually is useful in paying for my diving, uh, which is my first passion. Um, I started diving back in 1974, uh, and I teach for a variety of different agencies, both from a recreational standpoint and a technical standpoint. And given my uh, medical background and my diving history, I'm the uh, cardiology consultant uh, for Divers Alert Network. So I get a handful of emails and so forth and phone calls uh, from people either directly uh, or through Divers Alert Network every week. Uh, and some of that will be talked about a little bit here uh, on the talk. Okay, this is what I would call a seat of the pants talk. Uh, in cardiology, a lot of the stuff we deal with, uh, we have randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials to give very firm data. Uh, that is not what this is going to be. This will be more of just kind of a group of consensus kind of opinion. Now, while there is that, we have to realize that there's actually never been a single study that proved parachutes made skydiving safer. I think all of us would agree that we don't need to do a randomized trial there. Uh, so we're going to just do the best we can with the data we have uh, for this talk on aging. So how does that work? This, uh, the next several slides were given to me by, um, uh, the, by Dan with, um, uh, with the, the thought that how do we progress um, through our diving as far as from uh, being independent and needing assistance. Uh, these are from Neil Pollock. The first thing to think about for all of us is a lot of us, all of us have to think about our personal um, situation and how safe it is for us to dive. Uh, those of us that are instructors have a larger circle uh, from the professional standpoint, which would be our clients and students, and make sure that our health is not only just safe for us, but for our clients and students. This is kind of a graph looking at uh, how much support we need as we go through life. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we've got going from being young to being old, and then the level of needed support there on the y-axis or the vertical axis. And this curve looks something like this. So as you know, we certify people who are uh, children. We're very concerned about them. And young kids oftentimes will actually have, you know, two buddies uh, to go along with one small child uh, because they're very dependent on their diving. Once you get to a certain age and a certain experience level, you're then independent. And then unfortunately, as we get older, uh, we'll tend to transition to need a little bit more assistance and then we may become dependent again. Uh, what we're hoping to do in this talk is learn some information to try and shift this curve as best we can to something that looks like this, so that we 
maintain our independence for a lot longer. And then we have a more gradual transition. And hopefully by the time we would move to dependent, we're going to be 100 years old and dead from something else. So the mature dive, by the way, this picture in the upper right corner is my father uh, at age 80 um, with one of the, uh, the Wiki Watcher mermaids. I certified him at age 79 so he could dive with his grandchildren. Uh, so there is no upper age limit to diving. Uh, it's all based on individual capabilities and your health. That should guide whether or not you should continue diving. There are no specific data on certain ages being unable to dive any longer. There are numerous considerations that go into this as should you continue diving as you get older. Things like how strong are you or weak are you? What kind of physical work are you capable of doing? Obviously, we've got to carry heavy equipment around. Uh, what chronic diseases have you developed? Uh, and how is your cognitive function? Uh, there's lots of reasons uh, to continue diving as we get older. Um, it's a physical stimulus. It motivates a lot of people to maintain fitness. Uh, a slide will be coming up later. We don't actually get in shape by scuba diving, we get in shape to scuba dive. Uh, so this and some people to maintain their ability to scuba dive will promote more physical fitness. Uh, there can be intellectual stimulation, which is very important as we get older, uh, increasing and preserving your knowledge base, uh, promoting and retaining critical thinking skills by continuing to dive, continue to take additional courses, uh, take diving in different environments uh, can all lead to more intellectual stimulation. There's an emotional well-being. I think all of us would realize that we enjoy uh, scuba diving, so that's a positive motivator for us. And as people get older, they tend to become more uh, reclusive in that uh, they've lost family, they've lost friends, they've lost work environment, uh, and the social involvement by having a dive buddy or group interaction can be very, very helpful. So these are all the reasons that you'd want to keep diving as you get older, but we have to be realistic. And if you look realistically, this is what the Daniel, Dan Annual Report says about mortality uh, in diving. This is the number of fatalities that occurred uh, by the most recent report, uh, which was of the year 2019. And you'll see that the peak uh, deaths diving are in the age of 60 to 69. It starts going up dramatically in the 40s and 50s, peaking in the 60s. The numbers are lower after that, probably because there aren't that many people diving in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. But So we do have to realize that getting older is a risk factor for dying. Uh, while scuba diving, so we need to make sure we can do this as safely as possible. And we'll talk a little bit about where those deaths come from here in a little bit. Okay, so core protections. What do we need to do to try to make sure we are not one of those statistics? So the first thing is medical oversight. Uh, as we get older, it's very important for everyone to have a primary care doctor to make sure you're getting things like your colonoscopy for women getting your mammography, uh, making sure your cholesterol is checked, make sure your blood pressure is checked, and so forth, so you don't develop chronic diseases, or if you develop them, you get them treated early. Secondly, and this is the, probably one of the more difficult things, is honest and critical self-appraisal. I'll show you slides in a couple of minutes, but we all kind of remember who we used to be. We don't necessarily remember who we are at the moment, uh, and we need to be very honest and critical as to what sorts of things can we still do safely. Uh, this would involve things like our capabilities, our limitations, hazards, and so forth. Additionally, scuba diving and specifically decompression science is not that well understood. So recognize the limits of current knowledge. And as a result, you may want to add buffers to accommodate the unknowns and to be safer as we get older. Here's an example of what I was just talking about. We tend to remember who we used to be as opposed to who we are. Uh, there on the left side of the screen is me back in 1977. That was about a month after the uh, state swimming championships in high school and I was out diving in West Palm Beach. In my mind, I'm still that guy, okay? But realistically, I'm the guy on the right-hand side, okay? That person is not as physically fit and is not as capable of doing the type of diving I was doing back in that day. As, a as an example, this may be an appropriate shore dive entry for me in 1977, but now the appropriate shore dive entry for me is something that looks like this. And I think a lot of us are probably in that same kind of boat. Additionally, as we get older, unfortunately, our aerobic capacity, meaning like our ability to exercise to say run, jog, swim, whatever, is going to decline. Uh, if you look at statistical models by a group, Rosen et al. back in 1998, there's about a 1% per year decline after the age of 25. That's not after the age of 65, that's after the age of 25 uh, that we begin decreasing our aerobic fitness. Now, the question would be, can we do something to change that? And there was one study uh, that looked at former elite athletes 
ranging from age 25 to 40. And what they looked at was those who continued to be physically active versus those who became couch potatoes. And what you find is while there's a, a predicted risk of about a 1% per year decline, if you maintain activity and you stay very active, you can drop that lower to about 0.7% per year, whereas if you become a couch potato, uh, it grows to about 1.6. In other words, the more we can stay active aerobically, which would be running, jogging, swimming, whatever, uh, the, the more we're going to protect ourselves against this functional decline. And looking at things like strength and endurance have been shown to follow the same sort of pattern uh, with about a 1% decline per year uh, once we get into our 20s, after we get out of our 20s. So what should we do about that? What are the keys to maintaining uh, physical fitness uh, for scuba diving? Uh, there should be basically four um, areas to concentrate on. Number one is strength. So we need to do some form of resistance training whether that be manual labor, depending on what your job is, weightlifting, kayaking, climbing, you know, resistance bands, push-ups, rowing machine, whatever, something to maintain strength. We need to maintain our aerobic capacity, like we just talked about in the previous slide. That would be anything, I tell my patients, do whatever you like the most or whatever you hate the least. Uh, that could be running, cycling, swimming, um, rowing machine, whatever you want to do. Additionally, as we get older, we tend to become stiffer and less flexible. That can be a problem with things like putting on your fins, uh, reaching tank valves, and so forth. So to maintain flexibility, we need to do things that either require a lot of moving around like squash or racquetball, um, or doing something like yoga or Pilates to actually maintain flexibility. And then finally, as we all know, we tend to put on weight as we get older. Uh, so weight management aided by sound nutrition. So this is kind of the four kind of categories to look after. Uh, strength aerobic fitness, flexibility, and weight. Again, like I mentioned earlier, what we have to realize is you stay fit to dive. You do not dive to stay fit. I tell all of my students that if you're getting a lot of exercise of scuba diving, you're probably doing it wrong, okay? This should not be a really, a really high intensity uh, environment. Now, the next organ system to look at is how our lungs do, because obviously we need our lungs. So that Dan tried to do an aging diver study uh, a decade or more ago. Uh, and the problem was they had lots of fit divers that enrolled, but they couldn't find any unfit older divers actually enrolled in the trial. So it really wasn't a real helpful trial. The concerns were what we call functional capacity, which is kind of how are the lungs working? How much breath could you get in? And how were the lungs able to move air? And then the other concern was carbon dioxide retention to see if people were unable to get rid of carbon dioxide, they'd be more likely to have hypercapnia type problems. Uh, they looked at as much as they could physically fit older and younger divers. They exercised them at the equivalent of 60 feet of saltwater. Uh, and they measured these various things, which are part of lung function, things that are called dead space. Uh, that's where you're not really moving air except in and out of just the breathing tubes, um, your intidal carbon dioxide and your arterial blood gases as well. And they did find that as you got older, you didn't move as much gas along. You did have more dead space, meaning parts of your lungs really weren't interacting uh, and moving gas. But they had similar patterns of levels of carbon dioxide, both in your breathing and in your bloodstream. So not a major problem with that. Uh, that's me ice diving a couple of years ago. Uh, I would not recommend that. Uh, that's for me, was a one and done. Uh, but there is some neat things to learn about. So when we talk about thermal regulatory responses, when we normally get cold, we're put in a cold environment, what happens is the blood vessels in the, our skin will constrict to shift that warm blood into uh, our core to keep the core um, organs warm. And also by having a colder skin, you don't lose as much heat for your skin. So when they look at older divers, what they find is there's a difference in our ability to maintain um, temperature between older and younger people. There's a higher mean skin temperature of the older group. What that suggests is you're less effective at constricting those blood vessels to try and maintain heat. So what that happens is you're going to have more bloodstream to your skin, and that's going to cause you to accelerate heat loss and get colder. What do we do about that? Just change what you do, dive in warmer climates, or equipment change. Okay, there's no harm in saying everyone's in a three mil, but you're in a five or a seven mil. There's no downside to wearing hoods, vests, heated undergarments, whatever you need to do to maintain warmth. Just realize that as we get older, 
we don't we do have a problem maintaining heat uh maintaining warmth the way we used to when we were younger cognitive health uh as we all know uh as you get older there tends to be a decline with our cognition there's problems with learning and retention there's problems with processing speed and what you may want to call mental flexibility how can we avoid those problems or at least delay those problems the best way again is things like exercise and nutrition and then mental exercises again like i mentioned earlier staying active looking at ways to learn things always try to be learning something whether it be diving related or something else to kind of maintain that mental flexibility it looks like at least from the people i can see in the group there's a lot of us uh, who are over the age of 40 uh, and all of us are fully aware of what happens to our vision as we get older uh, so there is an age-related loss of visual acuity. This tends to be uh, seeing objects up close. So it's a near field problem uh, as opposed to a distance problem as we get older. Uh, that's not a problem seeing what fish you're going to shoot, but it is a problem trying to read your computer. Uh, so close in work like looking at your dive computer can be a problem. That obviously is a safety issue. If you can't read your dive computer accurately, you're putting yourself in significant harm. Most of us, however, tend to be very vain and nobody wants to admit that they can't see. Uh, so you stick your arm out as far as you can and still able to read your watch or read your dive computer. At a certain point, however, your arm won't get any longer. So you're gonna have to do something. Uh, and people don't like the idea of the vanity involved in putting in uh, lenses in their masks and so forth. But the ways you're gonna get around that, oh, by the way, this can be confused with what's called hyperoxy-induced myopia. That's something that would only happen to people doing lots of long rebreather dives on high PO2s uh, for the recreational market and for even most of the technical market, that's nothing to be concerned about. So our management would be surgical correction. So if people get, you know, a LASIK and so forth to correct their vision uh, or cataract surgery to correct their vision. Um, corrective lenses, that can either be contacts uh, or it can be a corrected mask. Um, and then go from there. What about hearing? You know, the other thing happens, not just our vision gets bad, but we all have that, uh, or all had that grandfather or uncle or something who never could hear. Uh, so we know that hearing tends to get worse as we get older. So one of the questions always was, you know, we deal a lot with our ears diving. We're clearing our ears. People get ear infections. They burst eardrums. Does diving actually worsen or accelerate uh, this hearing loss as we get older? And there was a lot of look, look uh, at professional divers. These are commercial divers. Uh, that showed both permanent uh, ear, hearing loss appeared to be more common, uh, as well as transient uh, hearing loss as well by these variety of studies. So that was very concerning that maybe diving was the problem. However, when they looked at sport divers versus controls, as opposed to commercial divers, there was really no change. So the concern is that really in those commercial divers, it probably wasn't the diving. If anybody's ever been on a commercial diving boat, it's very noisy. So it probably was the noise environment causing their hearing problems and not the diving per se. So there's no reason to think that diving in of itself is going to make your hearing uh, any worse. So how do we protect against this? Again, avoid extreme noise exposure. Um, those of us my age or a little younger and concerns of all the rock and roll concerts, I guess that's probably too late for that. Um, secondarily, things we can do when we're diving using low stress equalizing techniques, uh, things other than a Valsalva, which are a little traumatic to the ears, a uh, good neutral buoyancy to avoid barotrauma and so forth, just to protect your ears as best you can. Um, anybody that's an air hog and has to, has to come up the first one compared to their buddy or their group, may wanna dive the way this guy is on the, here on the right-hand side, that's a lot of tanks. Um, but as we get older, again, we have lots of orthopedic issues can come up. And we're again, we're trying to carry heavy tanks and walk to the back of the boat and then climb up a ladder and so forth. So that could be an issue. Uh, musculoskeletal problems can affect our gear choices. Um, what we want to dive in, how do we get these to and from the dive site and donning and doffing. Um, some people as they get older will move to side mount, which you can mount, which you can put on in the water as opposed to on the on the on the boat. Uh, you may not want to walk with doubles uh, all the way down to the uh, the dive site. Uh, some people as they get older will put their gear on in the water, take it off in the water. That's perfectly fine, especially on a dive boat. Just make sure if you have the dive uh, masters or dive guides help you get into and out of your equipment that you tip them appropriately, that they're, they're helping you a lot there. As we get older, our mobility decreases. Again, trying to walk around, trying to get fins on, trying to reach uh, uh, tank valves and so forth. Uh, that can be a problem both on the surface and underwater. Problems with 
underwater mobility can put could be a safety concern. So again, the more we can work on maintaining our mobility, the better. So what do we do? If these things happen to you, it does not mean you need to necessarily stop diving. You just may need more help. So you may need to make sure you've got a buddy that can help you. You may want to dive off of a boat uh, where there are people that you can help, uh, that you can tip to kind of help them help you get into and out of the water, but not necessarily a reason to stop diving altogether. You may just need to change the type of diving uh, that you're doing. We're going to move on to a couple of um, chronic diseases, specifically diabetes and cardiac disease, because that's the most common thing that hits people as they get older. Uh, I'm going to talk pretty much in some detail about diabetes. I'll tell you when, but you can turn your, you can just kind of go check your phone and kind of zone out here for a few minutes when they get to a couple of slides, unless you have diabetes. I imagine there's probably a few people on here that have adult onset diabetes, whether they let people know that or not. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the medications uh, for diabetes so you can know what you're taking and uh, what kind of risk that would involve. And then we'll talk a little bit about other, a couple of cardiac issues since that's kind of what I deal with. Um, diabetes historically uh, was felt to be a contraindication to scuba diving. So back 20, 30 years ago, if you had diabetes, they told you you can't dive. The problem with that is that people would dive anyway because they would have been certified before they're diabetic uh, and they just wouldn't tell anybody. So Dan decided with a, a symposium probably 20 years ago or more now to try and find out a way to see if divers with diabetes could dive safely as opposed to just saying don't dive. So currently, the situation is a little more controversial. It's felt that some diabetics can dive safely, uh, and the recommendations vary among agencies and vary among countries. There are both short-term and long-term risks to diabetes. Long-term, you want to have your glucose, your body's glucose, your sugar controlled, uh, because that will prevent some of the complications of diabetes going forward. The short-term risks, like diving, however, the problem is not having a sugar that's too high, it's having a sugar that's too low. And in fact, you can drop, diabetics can drop their glucose levels, their sugar, blood sugar levels by 70 or 100 points during an hour long scuba dive. Now, if your sugar, start, if a bad number, let's say 70, you start to get symptomatic. If you went in at 180, 190, which would be too high day to day, but then drop that to 110, 120, not a problem. If you have very well-controlled diabetes and you're only 120 and you drop that to 50, okay, you could be uh, unconscious underwater. So the main concern is low blood sugar with diving, not high blood sugar. The high blood sugars are the problems in a more of a long-term situation. So here's kind of the situation. The problem is symptomatic low blood sugar can occur one to two times per week in people who require insulin, even when they're not diving. Uh, and over 7% of people, again, requiring insulin uh, had such severe low blood sugar, they required external help. Uh, and this is more common in, when you have, again, intensive therapy, meaning very well-controlled sugars versus kind of allowing it to be a little more, uh, a little higher. And also the fact that some people don't recognize their symptoms when they get low blood sugars can increase its incidence quite a bit. The long-term risks um, include eye problems, that's what retinopathy is, renal disease or kidneys, neuropathy, uh, you know, nerve problems. And what a lot of people don't realize is that cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, is the leading cause of death in diabetics. And in fact, the risk of a diabetic who's never had known heart disease dying from a heart attack is equal to a non-diabetic who's already had a heart attack having a second one. So just the, the development of diabetes puts you at risk for coronary artery disease as if you already had established disease. So I'm going to go over a few medications. This is about the time you can tune out if you don't have diabetes, because I'm going to tell you kind of which ones are prone to cause low blood sugar and which ones are not a problem. So if you're taking these things, you may want to talk to your doctor. Um, there's a class of drug, obviously insulin, everyone knows insulin. Insulin does drop your, your blood sugar dramatically and insulin dependent diabetics probably should not dive because of that reason. Or if they have a glucose, if they have an insulin pump uh, and they have a way to get that monitor underwater, they just allow themselves to be less aggressively controlled uh, during the diving. But in general, we like to avoid di diving with uh, insulin-dependent diabetes. Uh, so following your reels, these are things like glipizide, glyburide, glimepiride. Uh, these will classically cause hypoglycemia and are not good drugs to take uh, if you're scuba diving. 
Uh, there's other agents, these Prandin and Starlix um, are not much of a problem. The best one out there is metformin, uh, which is a classic first line drug these days for adults who develop type 2 diabetes. Um, it's very effective and it does not cause hypoglycemia, so it can definitely be used safely with scuba diving. There's a whole bunch of other ones that are out these days. Um, things like precocic glycine aren't used as much anymore. Actos of Andy, again, aren't used quite as much as they used to be anymore. Those are not likely to cause problems. Again, insulin definitely can cause a problem. The latest drugs that are out there, the ones you see advertised on TV occasionally, Jardians, Farsiga, and Vacana, Genuvia, and so forth, and then the ones down the GLP-1 receptors down there, Victoza, Viana. All of these are very good drugs, very effective for decrease for, uh, for blood pressure or blood sugar control, but do not cause hypoglycemia. So most of the medications these days that we use for diabetes, uh, especially for type 2 diabetes, do not cause hypoglycemia and can be used safely with diving. The exceptions to that uh, would be the drugs like glipizide, gliburide, and so forth. Otherwise, you're in pretty good shape. And then insulin, you have to take on a case-by-case -case basis because, again, there is a concern of that dropping your blood sugar. So currently, in general, scuba diving is contraindicated for diabetics on medications likely to cause hypoglycemia, which would be insulin or those sulfonylureas I was talking about, glipizide and gliburide. And obviously, if you've had a lot of indoor organ effects, visual effects of bad neuropathy, kidney problems, uh, those people should avoid diving. The reason that we say that is, again, because severe hypoglycemia could cause loss of consciousness, which would be fatal underwater. Uh, you're unable to rest underwater, as could be done on land, uh, and diving certifications are given, quote, for life. Uh, and while you may have had very easily controlled diabetes at one point in time, you're now maybe a decade or more older, and you've got more problems, uh, and the disease may have progressed. So you have to be careful of that. Additionally, the concerns some people have are that the dive buddy standard that we use in diving is based on the assumption that both individuals can provide rapid and adequate support to each other. So Dan, when they put together the recommendation for diabetes, have recommended that if you're going to dive and you're diabetic, that you carry something with you, uh, some form of glucose that can be given quickly underwater, glucose paste or something, uh, and that you have a signal uh, that is known to your buddy that says, I think I'm beginning to get hypoglycemic. Uh, again, so that your buddy is aware of things. Now that's the case against diabetes. Uh, the case for allowing selected diabetics to dive Basically began by Dan in 1993. Like I mentioned, they knew that people were just lying on the forums. So they said, let's see if we can find out who can dive safely. So they sent a survey out to all the members at that time. There's 115,000 people that were members of Dan. 164 divers with diabetes responded. Uh, those had performed over 27,000 dives while being diabetic with no major complications. Uh, so they felt, okay, well, maybe this can be done safely. Um, at the University of Tennessee, they came up with a plan, which uh, Dan has recommended, which is that diabetics should check their blood sugars an hour before the dive, 30 minutes before the dive, and immediately before the dive, and then check it again post-dive. Like we mentioned, you can drop your blood sugar significantly during a dive. Uh, in doing this, uh, they found no significant cases of hypoglycemia. That hemoglobin A1c is just how well your, your diabetes is controlled. There's another study done by Duke. Um, back in 2004, looking at both insulin requiring diabetics and then controls. Um, no symptoms were reported, but like we mentioned before, post-dive glucose of less than 70, which is when things are starting to get a little dangerous, occurred in 7% of people with diabetes versus 1% of controls. So again, you want to be very careful of that. In the United Kingdom, they looked at their diabetics and they really only found two uh, fatalities. Both were in non-insulin dependent diabetics. And this is over a period of about 11 years and almost 9,000 dives. Uh, one was a patient who died of a heart attack, unrelated to any kind of hypoglycemia. And then there was a second death where there was no data. So again, the feeling again is the majority of diabetics, if well controlled, uh, can dive safely. So the current recommendations are that you've had no symptomatic low blood sugar attacks in the past year, no hospitalizations for diabetes in the past year. Your doctor feels your diabetes is well controlled. You have no end organ problems like kidney issues where you're dumping albumin in your urine or kind of uh, eye problems and so forth. And the recommendations are to dive shallower than about 100 feet and for less than two hours. And the rationale for that is if you're diving deep, you can end up with a, with a, um, a decompression obligation. 
and God forbid you had a problem, you would not be able to safely ascend directly to the surface. It's also recommended that diabetics not go into overhead environments like cave diving or wreck penetration. Uh, and it's recommended that they keep dives under two hours, again, because of the concern of dropping the blood sugar the longer you're diving. Okay, moving on to cardiovascular disease. This is the number one um, cause of death in older people who are diving. And in fact, it's felt that upwards of 30% of diving deaths are cardiac related. Uh, in the last annual diving report, which is in 2019 from Dan, uh, there were 228 deaths. Um, 57 were these are breath hold divers, uh, 92 were foreign divers. So they actually were 70 divers of US and Canadian divers, and we had autopsies on 20 of those. The vast majority were recreational divers. Uh, there were a couple of technical divers, uh, one student, and some other we didn't know that much about. What's interesting is of the witnessed deaths, 15 of the 30 witnessed deaths look like a sudden, a sudden cardiac death. So again, a cardiac issue. Additionally, 10 of the 20 deaths where there was available autopsy data, sudden death, again, most likely from coronary artery disease was the, was the cause of the fatality. So this is looking at even as high as maybe 50% of people dying with underlying coronary artery disease. Because of that, how do we screen for that? Uh, the feeling is if somebody wants to start diving, um, you would treat them as if they wanted to start jogging. Uh, so the people have been very inactive their whole life, they're over the age of 40, and they want to start an exercise program, we usually will put those people on a treadmill. Um, and even people under 40, if they're very poorly conditioned or have lots of cardiac risk factors to include things like diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking, and so forth. Historically, and this comes up when people have looked at these sorts of things, you'll hear this number battered around. Historically, it was felt that to participate in scuba diving, you need to be able to hit what's called 13 METs on a treadmill. Um, METs are metabolic equivalents. One metabolic equivalent is kind of what we're all doing right now, just kind of sitting around breathing. Uh, and then the more you're active you are, the more METs that is. So something like doubles tennis, maybe a few METs, singles tennis, maybe six or seven METs and so forth. Um, and they, this came about based on exercise physiology. And the exercise physiology is such that if you can hit a given MET level, you can maintain half of that for about 20 minutes or so. And six and a half METs, or half of 13, is the equivalent of swimming against about a one knot current. So the feeling was if you people came up down current, need to swim hard for 20 or 30 minutes, uh, you'd want them to be able to hit that. And that's where that 13 MET level came from. That's about 10 minutes on a standard Bruce protocol. I treadmill people every day, or not every day, but at least every week. It is uncommon uh, for people who get over the age of about 50 or 60 to be able to hit 10 minutes on a treadmill. I don't care who you are. So I think that's a very unrealistic number because there are not people dropping dead on dive boats every day. The current feeling is that if you can achieve about six and a half minutes, which would be the equivalent of walking two miles in 45 minutes, uh, that's adequate exercise for recreational diving. So that's kind of what you're looking for. Doing a two mile walk in less than 45 minutes, you're probably physically fit enough for recreational warm water diving, okay? Again, if you want the formal numbers, that'd be the equivalent of getting through about stage two of a standard Bruce protocol. Uh, that's going 2.5 miles per hour to 12% grade. That would give you seven Mets. Uh, and that's kind of what the standard, this is the standard treadmill protocol that we use for, uh, for cardiac disease. Now realize we're talking about this is good enough for warm water recreational diving. If you're doing technical diving, if you're doing cave diving, if you're a professional, uh, you should have a higher level of fitness. Okay, let's say you did your best to avoid coronary artery disease, but somehow you ended up with it anyway. You had a heart attack, you had bypass surgery, you had stents. Uh, can you continue to dive? I get that question at least twice a week from Dan from somebody. It happens all the time. For people with underlying coronary artery disease, the contraindications to diving would be if you have ongoing angina, so you exert yourself and you're getting chest pain, those people should not be diving because they're putting themselves at risk with diving. If you have a history of a prior heart attack, a myocardial infarction is a heart attack, specifically a heart attack that left your heart muscle weak. Okay? A small heart attack that left you with normal heart muscle function is not necessarily a contraindication in diving. If you have a very weakened heart muscle, that can be a problem. Uh, and the reason for that is just putting ourselves in the water, and that can be just uh, immersing yourself in a swimming pool, um, will cause a fluid shift 
of about 700 cc's of volume into your central circulation. And with a weakened heart muscle, that can put you into congestive heart failure. So we don't want people jumping in the water and going into congestive heart failure while diving. And then if you were to have ischemia is a term that means limitation of blood flow. So you've got a residual blockage somewhere that's limiting blood flow to your heart. And that causes dangerous heart rhythms. Obviously, you should not be diving underwater in the setting of dangerous heart rhythms that could cause you to lose consciousness because losing consciousness underwater would result in death. So this is the question I get all the time. Okay, I've had bypass surgery. I've had a stent. Uh, can I return to diving? And the issue is, yes, if you meet these criteria. If you have no evidence of ischemia, meaning you have a, a good exercise test, there's no evidence of any limitation of blood flow remaining to your heart after they did the balloons or the stents or the bypass surgery. If your heart muscle function has remained normal despite whatever event you had, if you're not on drugs that will markedly inhibit your exercise tolerance, that's not common anymore. It's recommended that those people undergo uh, annual treadmill testing to confirm that they have not developed any progression of their disease. Uh, this doesn't apply to dive professionals or to technical diving. That's done on a case-by-case -case basis. And even though you say, yes, you can return to diving, that person is at an increased risk than the person who doesn't have any coronary artery blockages. They just have to make a, a risk-benefit uh, assessment and if it's worth it to them to keep diving. The next most common thing I hear about is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular heart rhythm. It's the most common rhythm we deal with after people over the age of about 65. Um, the problem is it affects about one and a half to two percent of the general population, and it increases your stroke risk by fivefold. So whatever your stroke risk was before you developed atrial fibrillation, it just went up fivefold, and it accounts for about 15 to 20 percent of all strokes, uh, and it tends to be very bad strokes. So because of that, most people, I'll talk about this in a, in a slide in just a second, most people with atrial fibrillation, especially over the age of 65, uh, are going to end up on blood thinners. So the question is, can I dive on blood thinners because am I going to have a problem with bleeding? We have what's called a CHADS VASC score. Everything in cardiology has to have an acronym. Uh, this is a scoring system that allows us to predict what someone's stroke risk would be if we don't put them on blood thinners. And if you have two of these things or higher, you need to be on lifelong blood thinners. And yes, lifelong blood thinners. So you can imagine... 50% of the population over the age of 50 have high blood pressure. So if you're 65 and have high blood pressure, which is a large number of people, uh, you're immediately going to be on blood thinners forever. So the question is, can you dive on blood thinners? And the answer is yes. Are you going to be at increased bleeding if you were to get cut, scratched, scraped, or bitten? Yes. That is most likely going to be a nuisance bleed. That is not likely a life-threatening bleeding problem. Uh, you would also be at increased risk should you have barotrauma? If you had sinus problems with your sinuses, you have problems clearing your ears, you're gonna be more likely to bleed into those spaces than somebody not on blood thinners. That again is a nuisance problem that is not a life-threatening problem. The one theoretical concern with diving on blood thinners is that in the event, should you suffer decompression sickness? And should that decompression sickness be a neurologic problem in your brain or your spinal cord? you may be more likely, may be more likely to bleed into that area having been on blood thinners than if you're not on blood thinners. And that would make it potentially a more serious long-term effect or a, a uh, lifelong effect as a result of permanent defect from the, um, from the incident. So again, that's a theoretical concern. You have to take into risk what kind of diving you're doing. Recreational diving has a decompression risk of two episodes per 10,000 dives. And the vast majority of those are not neurologic or spinal cord. So take that into account. So everybody who's on blood thinners, we make it a case-by-case -case recommendation as to whether or not they want to take the risks of staying on blood thinners. Um, a large number of people can't take blood thinners. Uh, they'll have bleeding problems. So I'm just going to show you what we can do for people now. Uh, we have a new device uh, that is called a Watchman device. Um, there's a, a little structure on the left, what's called the left atrium, the top chamber on the left side, that looks like an appendix. It's a little pouch. And 90% of the blood clots that cause stroke and atrial fibrillation come from that little pouch. So what we can do is put a little plug into that pouch. That's done through a needle stick in the leg. It takes a, less than an hour. People go home the next day. Um, so that's something to think about if people are told they need to be on blood thinners, but they can't because of bleeding issues. The last thing we're going to talk about in terms of heart issues is what's called aortic stenosis. This is the most common valve problem in elderly people. This is a narrowing of the valve that lets the blood out of the heart. 
Uh, it tends to be a calcified. It's called senile calcific. I don't like that term. Um, senile calcific um, aortic stenosis. People who who develop symptoms either of chest pain, uh, congestive heart failure, which are breathing problems or passing out spells, that's what syncope is, uh, have a 50-50 chance of dying in the next year or so. So again, this is a very bad disease that's much worse than most cancers. Uh, so somebody with symptomatic aortic stenosis, that is felt to be a contraindication to scuba diving. In the past, the only way to fix that was opening up someone's chest, cutting out the old valve and replacing it with a new valve. Thankfully, we don't have to do that very commonly anymore. We have a new technique uh, that's called transcatheter air valve implantation, which we can do through a needle stick in the leg. This is a cartoon of the heart valves there. You see the aortic valve there on the left panel and kind of what it looks like as it starts to get thickened on the right panels. Um, this is kind of what the procedure looks like. It's done in a cath lab or in the operating room. That little valve there looks like a stent with a valve, in the, new valve in the middle. And we're able just to put that in position right where the old valve used to be. This is a picture one of a one we were doing the cap eye with a valve there inflated on a balloon, and it leaves the little valve behind. Again, it takes about an hour. People go home the next day. At that point, people can return to diving safely. The most common phone call that Dan gets is, I'm taking such and such, can I scuba dive? What you need to realize about medications uh, is that most medicines have never been tested under hyperbaric conditions. They've never been tested underwater, so we don't have a lot of data and having multiple medications can, can magnify that problem. The main question is not, can you dive on the medication? The main question is, why are you taking the medication? In other words, if someone says, can I die? I'm taking Dilantin, can I dive? Okay. The problem is not the Dilantin. The problem is that Dilantin is an anti-seizure drug. So the main problem is, can you be diving with seizures? The answer is no. So it's more, why are you taking the medication than the medication itself? Should you find yourself on medications, what you should do is investigate whatever known effects there are, work with your, your physician for what medicine is deemed suitable. You should first test them to make sure you're not going to have side effects under non-diving conditions, and then, prog then progressively test them under diving conditions and go from there. Lastly, if you remember, I mentioned that we don't have a lot of knowledge of decompression uh, science. It's uh, not as well understood as we would like. And because of that, our bodies, as we get older, don't handle decompression stress as well as they did when we were younger. So we need to be very, very cautious. Uh, so susceptibility to decompression and sickness may increase with age. We know that venous gas emboli, if you do echo studies on divers, that the uh, bubbles in the venous side, on the vein side, uh, definitely increase with age, but they don't tend to make it over to the left side through the lungs, so don't cause problems, but they do increase with age. That's by some studies there. We also know if people have patent femoral valleys, which are little flaps in their heart, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, they've been found to be larger in older people. This may be due to as we get older, the right side of our heart pressures tend to increase and that can push a flap open that was actually kept closed when we were younger. And behavioral choices can still make older divers safer. So as we get older, because of these concerns above and the likelihood of getting decompression sickness increasing, we should consider doing things like diving nitrox, uh, but diving on air tables or the air computer. Uh, if you're doing decompression diving, you should uh, pad your decompression, stay in the water longer, uh, or change your gradient factors, which we're going to talk about next. And assuming this will keep it. Oh, there we go. Okay, so decompression conservatism. There used to be, before the days of dive computers, there was what's called a 10% rule. This was to reduce the no decompression limits by about 10% for every decade beyond 30 years. That basically is just getting you out of the water faster. Um, you should try to dive multi-level profiles instead of square ones. In other words, uh, kind of like most diving is done on reefs or walls where you go to the depth and then kind of slowly work your way more shallow. That's a problem, obviously, if you're doing nothing but wreck diving where you're on the wreck and then you're just sitting on an anchor line. Uh, longer safety stops are better than shorter safety stops. Like I mentioned, diving nitrox, but on air tables, Will base or an air computer will get you out of the water sooner than you quote need to be unquote so it builds in a little bit of conservatism and then gradient factors we're going to talk about here in just a couple of slides and then we'll be done so this is if people are interested that's why i have this a lot of the new shear, a lot of the computers and especially the shearwater computers all allow you to set what are called gradient factors the concept you need to be aware of is there's what's called an m value which will be on the graph on the next slide this is kind of the line you don't want to hit. The idea is if you cross over this line, 
you're likely to bubble and cause decompression sickness. So the gradient factors kind of limit you how close you're going to allow yourself to get to that end line. As an example, they're reported in things like 3070 or 5070 or 1090. And what that means is how close are you willing to get to this end line? The first number would determine your first decompression stop if you're decompression diving. If you're doing no decompression diving, this number is fairly meaningless. Uh, the second number will determine how long you're going to stay in the water. That's the most important one. So you want that one to be conservative so you stay in the water longer. That will give you longer safety stops or longer uh, last stops on required decompression. And this is kind of sort of what the graph would look like. So ambient pressure, meaning depth, is there on the horizontal axis. So going to the right means you're going deeper. Uh, as you're, if you pick a given depth and then stay there, uh, you'll start to uh, absorb nitrogen into your tissues so that the compartment inert gas pressure on the, on the vertical axis will increase. And then you start coming up and you see that big black dot and then the line going down towards seven or eight o'clock. That is a normal ascent rate of 30 feet per minute. And if you were going all the way to the end line, you see you could probably continue for a lot longer before you'd have to stop. Whereas with that 30%, it's going to make you stop at a, at a deeper uh, place uh, and then kind of slowly off gas as you go up. So the concept here is really just to remember that conservative uh, is better. Uh, currently, leaders in the field, including Simon Mitchell, who some of you may or may not have heard of, he's the chief of anesthesia uh, at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. He's a, a very accomplished technical diver. Uh, he's a Navy, former Navy diver, uh, hyperbaric doctor, chief of anesthesia, uh, and a phenomenal lecturer, uh, smarter than I'll ever be. He currently recommends using high values of the low gradient factor, things like 40 or 50, and then low values for the high number, such as 70. Uh, and again, as we age, uh, these gradient factors should become more and more conservative, especially the high gradient factor. What some people have begun using this O-Dive system, and uh, Brandon uh, there at Cape Coral actually is a distributor for this and an instructor on this. So if this is something you're interested in, talk to Brandon. Um, the O-Dive system is a way of monitoring your own bubble score. Because again, all these are just kind of bell curves on what the general population is doing with bubbling. The question is, how are you, how, what is your physiology as an individual? And this is a, a um, device that allows you to see what your own bubble score is for a given dive. It gives you a value that looks something like this. So you, out of a score of 100, so you're, this is uh, bowling, not golf. Okay, you want high scores, not low scores. Uh, you start out with 100, and it looks at how risky it thinks your dive was in terms of depth, time, decompression, and so forth. And then it actually and subtracts numbers from 100. And then the black line, the number there that says 20, that's a bubble score. Uh, it goes in from zero to 40, and that subtracts some numbers. So you can get a score when you did a given dive. You can then tweak the, the app and see what kind of things you could have done to make the dive safer. Then when you do the next dive the following day or the following week, see if your score does improve and see if your bubble scores improve. So it's a way to kind of personalize your own decompression. The Dan's only concern with this device, or two concerns actually, one is it only measures the upper extremities. It doesn't measure things coming from your leg, bubbles from your legs. Uh, so that's a little bit of a limitation. The best way to do this would be imaging right over the heart, but that is not practical unless you take a lot of training. Uh, so this is a very user-friendly device. So it does have the limitation of only going for the upper extremities, though that does correlate well with the total body. And the second thing is, we want to make sure people use this in the way it was designed, which was to make diving safer, not to make diving more aggressive. Now, what you don't want is people say, oh, I did this dive. Look, my bubble scores were minimal. I'm not going to do as much decompression or I'm going to come up faster or whatever because it's obviously I'm not that risky. The idea is use this for safety, not to become more aggressive with your diving. Okay, so dive readiness with aging. Again, the most important thing is looking at yourself. What is your medical and physical fitness? What is your motivation for diving? What are your goals? And realistically, at this age, what are your abilities? Look at your buddy, your partner, and your team, making sure that you have the right goals in mind. If you have certain medical conditions, make sure your buddy is aware of that. Uh, if you need help uh, on a dive boat, make sure your dive guides and dive masters know that uh, so they can help you with a gear, uh, readiness, capability, compatibility, communications, dive plan, make sure you know what you guys are all doing equipment wise. Uh, setting up use limitations. Again, as people get older, they will frequently maybe go to smaller tanks. They may go to side mount. They may go to assisted diving uh, and so forth. 
And then look at the environment. Like I mentioned on the joke slides earlier, what may have been an appropriate dive for you 20 years ago may not be an appropriate dive for you now. Uh, maybe you should move to warm water Caribbean diving and not go to Scapa Flow and dive in cold technical waters to dive deep wrecks. Um, so what is the sea state, current visibility, and so forth. If any of these things are a problem, it may be time to start shifting from shared diving to supported diving and have some help. But realize that there's no particular age that requires us to hang up our fins. Uh, honest, informed appraisals are critical. Uh, and a commitment to maintaining health and readiness can lengthen your diving career. And then diving conservatively can minimize your risks. Uh, if people are interested, this is a textbook uh, to read, Assessment of Diving and Fitness by Bennett uh, in 2006. And again, I want to thank Neil Pollack uh, for his assistance with uh, some of my slides. And that should be everything. I'm open to questions if anybody has any. Brandon, are you there? Can I go see if anybody's... Yeah, no, I'm here. Um, okay. I, I, I've unmuted people, so if you guys have questions, you're you're more than welcome to. Uh, okay, I see one thing in the chat, uh, which says there's an adopted son that has hereditary spherocytosis. Are there additional concerns for him diving? Would he be able to dive? The numbers are stable, so forth and so on. Um, hereditary spherocytosis should not be a problem. That is a uh, a blood disease, uh, which is a change in the shape of your red blood cells rather than be a biconcave kind of uh, red blood cell, they're more sphere-like. Um, if, the, if his numbers are stable, he's not significantly anemic and has good exercise tolerance, has not required transfusion, uh, there should not be a problem with that person diving. That should not be a problem. Um. I have a question. This is Callie. Good evening. Good evening. I have a diver with diabetes in my class this semester. Okay. He's approved by his doctor to dive. I don't want to micromanage him, but I do want him to dive safely. So my questions are, as his instructor, what should I be doing to make sure he's going to have safe dives? What symptoms should I be alert for? How do I help him if he has an issue? Gotcha. So this is in the scientific diving program? Yep. Okay, so this is a relatively young individual that I'm assuming. Yeah, and college kids aren't necessarily known for being conscientious. Really? Never <laughs> heard never heard that before. Um, yeah, exactly. So the, he most, you, first thing you want to find out or be a concern, or the, the concern would be, this sounds like probably someone who's type 1 diabetic, if they're that young, if they've had this for a long time, uh, okay. which, which is an insulin problem. Um, so the pancreas isn't making insulin. So they, those people have to be on insulin. So that is a concern for getting hypoglycemic underwater. Um, it sounds like he already has an endocrinologist managing things. Do you know if he has an insulin pump? I don't. Okay. It would be common for them to have an insulin pump. Uh, and to be honest with you, if they are a conscientious teenager, which some of them are, a lot of them are not, but some of them are, um, they tend to be actually very, the diabetics, uh, who are very good about it, are very, very knowledgeable about their disease uh, and are very, very conscientious with controlling things. Um, okay. what, so what you would want to know, you would, you need to, what he would need to make sure of um, is that he or she, um, is that they check their blood sugars immediately before diving. Um, and if their blood sugar is relatively low, let's say less than 100 or 120, they probably should not dive. Uh, because like we mentioned, you can drop your sugar 30, 40, 50 points or more diving. Um, and they should check their, their sugar again after diving. Um, they should uh, dive with buddies who under do know they're diabetic. Uh, he should dive with some form of oral glucose that he could take underwater oh. if he or she were to develop symptoms underwater. Okay. Uh, and should have a signal to, to his instructor and to the team and his buddy that if you were having symptoms of hypoglycemia, that they could be aware of that so we could abort the dive. Um, okay. That person probably should not be doing technical diving um, with required decompression or in an overhead environment. Uh, and if you want to, um, there is a, if you go to the Dan website, there's an actual um, uh, book, or I think it's called a symposium, whatever, on dive with diabetes. And they've got a one page chart that goes through exactly what that, kind of things yeah. that you do. Yeah. So that's the main thing. So just make okay. sure that everyone's aware, make sure there's a signal, make sure it has oral glucose and make sure he's checking sugars before and after diving. Okay. And 
if he is having any sort of issue, am I doing anything different than normal first aid procedures? Other than other than getting, make sure you get some glucose, no. Okay. So I should know where his glucose is. Correct. Okay. He should, know, he should know and you should know where it is and he should have a signal that you know if he's concerned his blood sugar is dropping. Okay. And if he isn't conscious, then I'm just calling rescue him. Rescue diver. You're, okay. just go, you're becoming a rescue diver. Okay. Uh, and then get him to the surface. And if they're able to take something oral, you know, depending on what their conscious level, once you get them to get them, you know, uh, on the surface, you could try to give them some glucose. Otherwise, you can treat it just as a normal rescue. Perfect. Okay. I mean, not perfect. We don't want that to mean. happen, but thank you. That's really helpful. Oh, you're very welcome. I would like to to add something there, if you don't mind, Doc. Sure. This is uh, Jorge yeah. Bueno. He's one of the internal medicine doctors at Watson Clinic. Um, in in terms of diabetes, uh, uh, in general, at least in our, in our in our patients, we always recommend it. Uh, particularly when instructors uh, ask us, uh, uh, we always go as a general guideline: is uh, if the diabetic patient use uh, long acting insulin, should not be a problem for them to use it; they're not cause hypoglycemia. Uh, in a short term whatsoever. If they use short acting insulin, then, then they should not use it before diving. And every instructor and diver should know that the high concentration sugar come in a small package similar to the ketchup package where they can open and they can actually take it under the water without any problem whatsoever. It's a, a, a honey type of sticky substance. Right. They can put it in their mouth and it's easy and it works really fast. Right, as I said, they got to have some way to have taken oral glucose. It's a, usually it's a little gel kind of thing to get up quickly. And you're right, I should have mentioned this difference on, on insulin. The long acting is not a problem, it's a short acting. It's just like if you had somebody going into surgery, you'd want to have them, you know, hold off on their fast acting glucose the morning of surgery. Same kind of thing with diving. You want the sugars to be high, not low uh, going into diving. Thanks, Jorge. Well, thanks so much, Doug. And uh, we really, really appreciate that. And if you might have any uh, questions, they can always get in touch with Doug um, or uh, Dan as well, too. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. And uh, thanks again, Doug, for that. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed this segment and listening to Dr. Ebersol about the aging diver. That is something that I am very cognizant about. You know, I'm, I'm nearing half century myself, really close. Uh, a lot of my friends are already there, and a lot of my other dive buddies are even older than, uh, than that. So it is something that we as divers, we need to be realizing that, hey, we're not in our 20s anymore. How do we take care of ourselves a little better? How can we keep ourselves in shape and be prepared for that next dive? Because we all know we want to go back. We want to go back for that next dive. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed this segment. It is a reconstruction, so it's better quality than all the rest, but I appreciate you all. Please see the next video down below, and we'll see you on the next dive.